Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Sethian. Uh, I'm amazed you guys are all inside on such a beautiful day out there, but, you know, thanks for attending. I'm about to give a talk on the art and technique of lighting buildings and streets. That's an awkward title with the best I could come up with under the heavy pressure from Andrew Dodge to come up with something. Uh, during the talk, I encourage questions of clarification. If I've confused you, which is likely, please go ahead and ask me right then and there. But I would appreciate if what you want to do is engage in a discussion, uh, wait until the end. So without further ado, we'll start. I am fascinated with lights in building. I don't know, uh, lights on a layout. Probably originated back when I had a Lionel 133 station. I just love the way it looked and I love the way it lit up. This is, I had very fond memories of that station lit at night. However, as my childhood imagination has dissipated with age, which what happens to all of us, reality sort of reared its ugly head. You take a hard look at that station and there's several issues with it. First of all, the walls glow. Second, there are hot spots from the interior. There is light leaks from under the roof, light leaks around the windows, light leaks under the foundation. You had this featureless, what I call this building is condemned type of windows. You know, what's going on inside there? And of course, if you weren't careful, light from the building was coming onto the backdrop, which was not quite that realistic. So what I'm gonna talk about today and hold on a second here, folks. I would, there we go. I need to get all your faces off my screen so I can see what I'm talking to. Um, this is the outline of the talk. I'm gonna talk about light sources and how to power them. I'm first gonna talk about inside lights, what is going on inside of buildings and structures, how to prevent that 133 station look, stop your walls from glowing, sealing light weeks around windows, roofs and doors, how to achieve uniform lighting in the building. And above all, the underlying theme for this whole talk is to see the light, not the bulb. You wanna hide the lamps. I'll then go on to outside lights, external building lighting, such as porch lights, uh, entryway lights, lamp posts, and billboards and signs. And finally, I'm gonna have a special sex of special effects which is probably, you know, about half the talk. Enhancing forced perspective with lights, use of electroluminescent panels, create things like light up letters. A little whimsy, I'm gonna show you how to make a full moon that glows, talk about shadow boxes, and a whole lot more. So, it's on with the show, as they say. Let's give examples of illumination sources. There are really two main sources. One are incandescent bulbs and one are LEDs. On the left, we have the classic bayonet lamps, uh, the kind that appear in the Lionel station and countless other structures. This is running, this particular one is running on 14.4 volts AC. And by the way, all my lights are driven by 8.6 volts AC. You don't have to predict that particular value, but I do recommend having a lighting bus standard. Makes life a whole lot easier. Continue with the incandescent bulbs, there's the grain of wheat lamps or the grain of rice lamps, which could be standalone or in fixtures like lamp posts and entryways. When you get to the LEDs, I broke them up into two main categories. One are the so-called micro or nano or pico LEDs. They haven't gotten to femto yet, but I'm sure they will. These are basically miniature and decreasing in size. Evan Designs is one of the suppliers I use for them. And then there are the more conventional LEDs, such as what Woodland Scenics use. They're surface mount. They can go in lamp posts, entry lights, and not only Woodland Scenics has it, but Atlas has them, and many other suppliers have them. Now, LEDs need a little bit of, uh, you know, you can't just hook them up to a transformer or to a power supply. They're a little bit snickety. They're current sources and you have to limit the current that goes the LED, not so much the voltage. So there are three ways to do it. 
The cheapest way by far and away is get a quarter watt resistor. There, you can get them from 500 to 5,000 ohms. You can get higher than 5,000 ohms, but generally what that does, that dims the bulb, the LED too much. And because LEDs don't like reverse voltages, if you're using an alternating current, you need to put a diode. So you simply put your power supply, a diode, a resistor, and then the light source. That is cheap, but it's not necessarily easy, and it gets really cumbersome particularly if you want to vary the intensity of lights or you have many of them. Uh, you can do it, but it's a pain in the ass. So there are a couple of uh, things out there that make your life easy. One of them is this JWA LED lighting regulator. It takes AC anywhere from eight to 18 volts. Uh, each lighting regulator is one channel, but you get two of them for $19.99. The AC connects up right there, the DC connects up right there, and you can barely see it, but that's a miniature potentiometer that varies the intensity of the light. This is particularly useful for things like passenger car lighting, you know, where you want to vary the light, or a single set of lights that you want to vary the intensity. If you want to vary the intensity of multiple LEDs in a simple structure, I use the Woodland Scenics Light Hub. Yes, I know this just plug and place this, whatever it can be, can be a bit pricey, but parts of it are really make life much, much easier to use. This is the light hub. It takes AC in or DC in, and there are four light outputs and their intensity is controlled by these dimmer controls you see here. What I like about these, no, they're not made to mill specs. They're not suitable for space flight or nuclear reactor applications, but they do the job and they're durable. More importantly, the intensity is very easy to set. You can start turning that knob and if you turn a little bit too much, you can back off on the knob a little bit and you'll go back to where the intensity we were before. There's no, if you will, slop in the system. Now, before anybody asks, I have no experience with fiber optics for layout lighting. I have a lot of experience with fiber optics, but not for layout lighting. So I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm even gonna spell about properly. I'd like to talk a little bit about how I light my layout room because that enhances the nighttime effects. On my layout, the walls and ceiling are painted two shades of blue, uh, a darker shade and a lighter shade, actually a light blue and a lighter blue to try to give the effects of clouds and variations in the sky. All the lighting on my layout is supplied by MaxLight strip LEDs. And this is what they look like. I've got this one turned down real low. Basically it's a bar, a strip, about seven eighth inch square with a bunch of LEDs in it. And they conveniently supply a diffuser on it. So when you turn the lighting up, it gives nice diffuse light. Unlike a lot of LED systems, these things are dimmable from 5% to 100% maximum brightness, which makes it really easy to do photography on your layout when you want to vary the lighting in the layout room. The color temperature I use is 5,000 degree Kelvin, which is not quite as bright as daylight, but it's fairly white. For those of you who like a warmer look, you can also get a 3,300 degree Kelvin uh, light bar, all from the same sources. Their lengths vary from six inches to six feet, and you can plug them all together with built-in interconnects, or you can get you know, wires of various length that pre-made for you to allow them to be a, a distance apart. They're made by MaxLight. That's the website down here. And the nomenclature they use is, a, in this case, 12 LB50 to 12 is the length of the light bar in inches. The LB stands for, oddly enough, light bar, and the 50, is the temperature in degree Kelvin uh, divided by 100. So now let's get on with the show, lighting inside buildings. Stop the walls from glowing, sealing light leaks, achieving uniform lighting, and my mantra of see the light, not the bulb. There are many articles have been written about how to prevent your walls from glowing. Aluminum foil is my material of choice by far. It is, can be made to conform to the inside of the white uh, wall. 
It is easily glued on with 3M77 uh, adhesive and the aluminum can be painted anything you want or wallpaper stuck to it or whatever. Um, a little bit of a side break. If you want to cut aluminum foil or anything precisely, I highly recommend a number 11 scalpel blade, not the standard Exacto or Excel number 11 blade. These blades are much sharper, they're much thinner, and it makes it very easy to make precise cuts in aluminum foil and everything. I'm sure those of you who tried to cut aluminum foil with a number 11 blade, you got an equal chance of tearing the aluminum as opposed to cutting it. This will solve your problem. And the best news is they can be held inside a conventional hobby knife holder. And they're actually cheaper than number 11 blades. You can get these on eBay. And I think it was $8.99 for a pack of 100. So the walls I showed you earlier on, they were the walls of a used car office. I'm also a car nut. So I'm not a rivet counter, but I am a lug nut counter. I'm very precise about how my car should look. So this is right here is the one of the walls I showed you. This is another one right here. The walls, this is a wood kit, by the way, um, Bar Mills uh, wood kit. This is just the awning. Note, I make I use a wiring bus from N scale track. I guess if you're an N scale, you can make the wiring bus from Z scale track, but it makes lighting very, very easy. You just connect all the wires to that bus, all the, from each of the rooms, and then that connects to your power source. And this is what the used car lot looks at night. You can see you get nice uniform illumination because the bulbs are up in the ceiling, the aluminum is glowing, and it has, it's a pretty good effect. By the way, uh, this green thing here, which you might find distracting, is actually uh, the catenary on my layout. I should have pointed out that I am, my layout is inspired by uh, the electrified Northeast quarter circa 1956 in New Jersey. Okay, now sometimes you're dealing with inner walls that are textured. Uh, they might have some sort of a pattern engraved on them or whatever. In this particular clay at pace, my inner walls have got a plank-like structure. There are these vertical cuts in the walls. This is just scribe styrene. In that case, you really can't use the aluminum foil on the inside obviously because it'll hide the texture. So what I do is I make a sandwich. There's, you know, you can see these are labeled. There's an outside wall, there's an inner wall. You hold the one layer of aluminum foil on with the 3M77. I don't recommend using the 3M77 for the other wall to the aluminum foil because it tends to be a bit messy. I actually just use conventional glue sticks like the Yuhu uh, glue stick. That's tends to hold the aluminum on rather well. If you want to, you can seal the edges with a little bit of CA glue. So what I'm doing here, I'm making Princeton Junction Station, which was this kind of, you know, kind of mundane little hut that they had along the Pennsy Main Line, probably the most uninspired station the Pennsylvania Railroad ever had. And this is the, you can see the styrations of the walls, the aluminum foil is between here. A couple features about this. First of all, because I scratch built this, it means I didn't have the luxury of really precise cut window openings, uh, despite the scalpel blade. So I had to make these internal frames to be light blocks around the window to prevent light from getting between out between the window and the wall. Second of all, I added angle braces on the corners. That does two things. First of all, it adds structural support, obviously, but also it tends to, it will block any light leaks around the corners where the sides and the ends meet each other. Similarly, in the ceiling, what I do is this is an angle around the ceiling. This is the entire roof of the structure. I made the platform roof and the station roof one piece because I think that's how they did it in the real station from all the uh, photos I could see. And these angles here, note they're painted to match the inside of the edge of the station. That serves to guide the roof onto the station and it prevents light, locks, light blocks from coming under the roof. 
I also want to point out something here, which I'll get to later on, more of my mantra of see the light, not the bulb. These are lamp fixtures to prevent direct side shine of the light out the window. And all these are styrene tubes, then painted brown. I've got one style here for inside the station. And under the platform loop, there's the, the tube. And then there's an unpainted styrene tube on the inside of that. That gives the effect of a glowing uh, lens, if you will, diffuser on the outside of the light. And it works really well. I'll show you that in a minute. Another thing you have to worry about is sealing under the floor. For this application, um, the angles didn't work because of some logistics problems. So I simply use this Alex plus latex caulk, uh, black in color, obviously, and put a fine bead of it between the wall and the floor right there. A little bit about how I use the light hub. There are a lot of lights in this station structure. There's the platform lights. There's the light inside the station. There are lights shining on the signs that say Princeton Junction. There's a phone booth that gets lit up. And there's a couple of billboards that get lit up. You want to vary the intensity to all of them. So what I made was this, if you will, brain control right here, junction, under the roof of the station, in which I can control the intensity for all the different lights. By the way, the roof is held on with a magnet. So the beauty of this whole system is after the station's in place, after you got all the scenery in place, you lift off the roof, you turn on the lights, and then you adjust each of these individual dimmers to get the exact intensity you want. If you were fooling around with individual resistors, you'd be driven crazy. And if you put this control system under the layout, well, you'd have to do more gymnastics than I'm capable of to hop in and out of the layout. With all these LEDs, I think there's 12 of them in there. I'm only drawing 35 milliamps. That's what this number is here is for. Remind me so I don't overtax the system. And the final result is that. This is Princeton Junction Station with the obligatory GG1 coming into the station. You can see all the lights under the platform, the lights in the station, the lights lighting a little sign here. And I can't see the phone booth that's around the corner, but I will. Um, show you that later. And incidentally, my friend Rick Wright would like me to point out that right here is a poster advertising the movie A Stranger Stalked New York. And this particular view has Evelyn Keyes, who is carrying smallpox, if you haven't seen the movie. She just gets off the Congressional Limited from, uh, oh, sorry, the PR Congressional from Cuba. I'm not sure how that works, but it certainly is visually appealing. Okay, sometimes you make a building where there's just many light leaks that are built into it. This is a model of Nassau Hall. It was at one time the first capital of the United States. It was built in 1756. Nobody makes a model of Nassau Hall, oddly enough. And more importantly, because of the way I was forcing perspective, I needed a model that was about 1 100th scale, which isn't a standard scale. So what I did was I took photographs of the building all the way around and made the building from photographs. Each side or a horizontal surface, sorry, vertical surface, is a laminate of two identical photos. The outer layer, the window has been cut out, and I've got spacers between the layers to give a frame to the window. I glue the whole thing together and then add 3D re details like the roof, the ivy, uh, the clock tower up here, a little balcony and all that sort of stuff. The problem with you do that is you might imagine every place there's a seam is a light leak. The way you get around that is with latex caulk, that Alex plus caulk I told you about, and you just line it at where the roof comes together, where the roof meets the building, the corners of the building, et cetera. I gotta tell you, this is a messy prog process, but you know what, after a while you get real good at it. Uh, you may not be surprised to know this was not the first building I assembled like this. Uh, that one ended up in a pile of black goo all over the place. But it does a great job of sealing the light leaks you know, right here. And if I had to do this building over again, I would probably fill in the actual window so they don't, millions don't glow as well. 
Now let's get on to lamp placement. I'm gonna start off with buildings that have no interior and no floors. In other words, these are ones that are kind of towards the background, not the far background, but you know, close enough. First of all, place the bulbs behind the near wall. So the, between the floors and put them in a trough of aluminum foil. What you're trying to do is to stop side shine, meaning light going laterally outward and you can see the bulb when you do that. I put aluminum foil on the back walls. That evens out the illumination. It's up to you if you wanna color the aluminum foil or not. Sometimes the light misting of a tan plate looks a little more realistic. I think that's what I did here. And finally, you wanna use window treatments to obscure the fact that you've got an empty interior. In other words, avoid that this property is condemned look you see here. You'll notice that I've got entry lights right here. There's one, one behind the street light, another one right there. I use Woodland Scenics, uh, in this case, O-scale street lights. And yes, the sharp right among you will notice there is a mirror right there. I only have a slide about window treatments themselves. <clears throat> One of my favorite techniques to make Venetian blinds is just scribe styrene sheets. Get them in whatever scale you want, whatever width you want. If you want, you can actually dribble a little thin black paint between the, the, in the scribes. Doesn't matter, it has a pretty good effect. And you can even drill holes in them and cut them out and break them out. Another way for cheap window, uh, window coverings is to use curtains. I take a curtain ad, I don't remember what product this was, take that picture, square it up, and then start bending it, you know, at the center so it makes a V all the way open, all the way closed, or whatever. This is a hotel in the background on my layout, and you can see that does a pretty good effect of um, making the effect of curtains. Use colored paper for shades. Now I cheated here, I used commercial shades because I didn't want to make this little hanging pull, but you know what, on some of my buildings I don't have them, it doesn't matter. It gives the effect. And the beauty is you can get those colored paper and everything you want. Since we are all in this area, or most of us, I recommend going to Plaza Art Supplies or the Pan Am Shopping Center. They have a whole menagerie of different types of papers. And matter of fact, even art supplies. You will never get a model railroad oriented weathering compound again. You go there, it's cheaper and they got more shades and the staff is extremely knowledgeable. And finally, uh, I used commercial lace curtains. I can't remember what the manufacturer was. Maybe somebody knows, but they were actually HO scale and you just cut them up and put them in. And of course you can have a little fun. You can have a couple of blowing out the window and things like that, or you know, half drawn, half closed. The idea is, is you're obscuring the fact that the building is fundamentally empty. Now, if you have a detailed interior, that's gonna require a little more work because you wanna show things in the interior, you wanna make it easy to see. And again, you don't wanna see the bulb. So this is, it started off life as a plastic built gas station, which I modified um, you know, with all sorts of signs and chrome trim and stuff like that. There are six grain of wheat bulbs in the station. Most of them are in the roof. And again, I use the aluminum foil to prevent the roofs from glowing. I want to call your attention specifically to the brass uplights. What these are are brass tubes. There's a grain of white wheat bulb in the center of it. There's one there and one there you can't see. And that's how you get that well-defined illumination on the mobile gas sign uh, on the sides. Okay, if you had detailed interiors and multiple floors, that requires even more lights. Again, it's complicated, but it's worth it. This is a hardware store. Um, the lower level is the hardware store itself. The upper level is residence, which is pretty common in a lot of structure. For the lower level, I used LEDs to mimic fluorescent lights. There are also these four LEDs on the outside. For the upper level, I use grain of wheat bulbs to mimic incandescent lights. And you can see I put a somewhat complete interior on the inside. But the results 
Eight lights with two color temperatures seems excessive, but the results, in my opinion, are worth it. You can see the incandescent light glow in the upper levels. You can see the fluorescent in the bottom. Somewhat obscured by the door is this happy couple prevent buying their first birdhouse. The rest of the interior, other than what's in the windows, are is just a photograph. And some of you probably recognized Ayers Ryan and Hardware Store. It's in Westover. I used to go there when I was a kid. I'm glad it's still around. I went in there to take up pictures of the interior, asking the manager first. He said, sure, gave me a very quizzical look, took lots of pictures, went home, and then I got curious. I dug out my high school yearbook where there was an ad for Ayers Variety Store, and the interior was exactly the same back then as it is now. Some of the items on the shelves have changed, but the floor and the layout was the same. And I won't tell you I went to high school, but it was a long time ago. Okay, there are occasions when you want to see the bulbs, such as when you're dealing with lampshades, and it's pretty common to see the bulb. In which case, use your grain of wheat bulb. You can't do this with an LED because an LED doesn't look right no matter how you do it, and let it stick out a little bit under the lampshade. Just make sure you have enough of them to get you the illumination you want. Uh, this is a tractor factory that I've got here. Now let's go to lights outside the building. External building lighting, lampposts, wall lights, up lights, billboards, and signs. This is an example of an external building light. There is a very nice selection both through Woodland Scenics and through Walther's of entries and wall mounts. Uh, these are the gooseneck lamps that uh, Woodland Scenics sell. I find the O scale ones are too big, so I use HO ones. And if you're an HO scale, I took a look and I would use N scale for those. For N scale, no, well, Martin, you're on your own. You can, you can figure something out. If you want to use a grain of wheat bulb, the grain of wheat bulb, as I said, doesn't look that realistic. But what I do is I insert it in a piece of polyethylene tubing with grooves cut in the outside. This polyethylene tubing is used, among other things, to guide the control rods and linkages in model airplane, remote control airplanes. So it's easy to find. It's about, oh, maybe an eighth inch OD and maybe a sixteenth or inch ID. This is a close up of that. All I did was I took a piece of polyethylene tubing, uh, held it in my lathe, but you could do it with a drill press, I mean, a, in a drill as well, and just cut grooves in it. And it gives that jelly jar look that a lot of outside lights used to have. Up lights. A lot of buildings in major cities have up lights, you know, lights which are exactly what they sound, the lights point up. Um, in this case, there's one here and one here. And I actually used HO scale yard lights, which date back to about 1957. I had them as a kid on my HO layout and they work great. The reason you want to use something like that is an up light needs to be fairly well focused. You don't want the light going past the building and putting a shadow on the wall. Yeah, there's one here, I know that, but it's not as dramatic as it could be otherwise. Incidentally, this building here, is made from 19 City Classics HO scale, uh, the Art Deco building, I think it's called the Bomb Building. Okay, for lampposts, there's a lot of opportunities here. It needs to do all, everything new in this hobby. You can buy it, you can kit bash it, or you can build it from scratch. Woodland Scenics, Walther's, We Honest, that's the Chinese company that sells on eBay, has them, Atlas, Merklin, et cetera. I didn't have enough room to list them all. We Honest, by the way, is a very interesting company. Their name is We Honest in the sense that they will always get it to you by slow boat from China, but also their name is We Cheap because of every 10 of these things you'll buy, there'll be something wrong with one of them. Either it won't work or the color temperature is way off or it'll flicker or whatever. But since you're talking about five bucks for five of them, you know, the cheapness is more just annoying rather than any kind of thing you get upset about. You can kit bash lamps. This is a wee honest gooseneck. 
here going up like that. And yes, I model the Pennsylvania Railroad. So I added these PRR type spirals, which are characteristic of all the station lamps. I built a list, little plastic cylindrical form, wrapped 28 gauge copper wire around it and soldered it in place on the lamp. Um, it took a one or two tries for how to solder it on so I didn't burn out the wires going to the lamp, but that's another story. And then of course you can make these from scratch. This is a wood dowel suitably distressed with a razor uh, saw. That's a grain of wheat bulb in the shade of here. The whole thing is soldered together with silver solder, by the way, otherwise it can break on you easily. And one of the connections goes from the lamp directly to the brass structure. The other one is the simulated support that goes up and through the tube and it works rather well. Okay, billboards and signs. Um, you can use the gooseneck entry lamps that I showed before. If you use the ones with a grain of wheat, like I show here, particularly the one from Walther's, you need to install a shine shield on the outside of the bulb. By that, on my outside, I mean between the bulb and the viewer. This is nothing more than a brass tube that has been cut in half lengthwise and either glued or soldered to the lampshade. If you don't do that, that green elite bulb is gonna shine directly in the viewer's eyes and you can't see the billboard. It's not that hard. And it was my routine standard operating procedure until all these LEDs came along. Cause those you don't have to, you, do any shielding. You simply bend the gooseneck, you know, sufficiently that it shines only on the sign and not in your eyes or any place else. The only problem with them is the goosenecks are rather short and I didn't want to mess with building extensions. So in order to get a uniform lighting, excuse me, you need a lot of them. I think I have 10 along here, the lighting, this Mason manufacturing sign, and as you can see around here. And if you look real closely, you'll notice I didn't bend this one enough, but I'm gonna leave it as it is. I'm sure if I try to bend it back, I'll end up taking the building down and repairing something. Now let's go on to special effects. Um, backdrop lighting, using building lights to enhance force perspective, headlights and taillights on cars, cheap and easy way to light up pedestrian underpasses, enhancing Miller engineering animated signs and using their electroluminescent panels, the use of shadow boxes, that moon I was talking about, and using lights to shine through the wilderness and above all, don't overdo your lights. Take advantage of them to use them to spotlight various things. Okay, this is my city, affectionately named New Lion. You saw the bank earlier on, there it is up there. One of the things I do, and I learned this from Dennis Brennan, is don't just take building flats and put them up against the wall because they'll look flat up against the wall. If you have the room, give your oh, yeah. building some question. Okay. If you have the room, make your building flats one or two inches deep, just something like that to give them a 3D perspective. And then don't back them up against the wall, move them away from the wall about four inches, three inches, anything will do. What you're doing is creating something in the artistic world known as movement. At least I'm giving the artistic world credit for it. By that, I mean, if you look at the sky, the sky has specific features painted in it. They're dull, again, mixing my two different colors of, of blue, but that is stationary. And then if you are viewing this thing and you walk even a little bit laterally with respect to the city, this case, the Chrysler building here, will appear to move with respect to the background. Same with all the other taller buildings. That sense of movement or the appearance of the movement makes a big deal. It adds a whole lot to the impression and illusion of depth because of 3D to the structure. Now, in order for that to work, you're asking what this has to do with lighting, I'm about to show you, you need to make sure your sky is fully lit. You don't want shadows of the buildings on the sky, 
I pretty much did that here. And you wanna make sure the sky is illuminated all the way down as far as you can see. And yes, if anybody notices this part's darker than that person, that's because I turned this bulb over without realizing it until I took the picture and I was too lazy to go back and change it. But anyway, what I do is I put those light bars on the base right behind the buildings. So this blue is the backdrop wall. You can see where I didn't bother to get the seam right because the building was geared by the buildings. This is the back of that big hotel with the green loop. And this is an L, uh, one of those light bars shining up. You have to position them a little bit and you gotta put baffles to make sure it doesn't end up lighting shadows on the ceiling, but it's a very good effect. Now, at nighttime, you can play even some more games. What I do is I dim the lights in the background building, like this one, this one, Chrysler building, this building here, a little bit of this one. If the buildings in the background have dimmer lighting than the buildings in the foreground, it helps enhance that sense of force perspective that we all know about. And yes, my buildings go from O scale to S scale to HO scale to N scale to I don't know what scale this Chrysler building is. I pardon, pardon me for that, it's a little bit schlocky, but I like the Chrysler building, it looks good there. Little side story is that's a um, department 56 building and it didn't quite work out right the way I wanted it to, so I cut it all up. Cutting a ceramic building is a little bit of a trick, and I want to replace lights or whatever, and I posted what I did on the online forum, and I got several pieces from hate mail from people accusing me of ruining a collectible, but I don't know. And yes, if you notice right here, some of my building lights are appearing on the background. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Head and tail lights on cars really look pretty cool. But for me, they take an awful lot of work. Most of the cars in O scale, first of all, you, you aren't gonna get them in O scale, you're gonna get them in 143rd scale. You learn to live with that. And they're die cast and they're held together with uh, rivets and you know, all sorts of you know, non-tamper bolts and nuts for lack of a better term. So you gotta take them all apart and then put the lights in them. But it's a good effect. This is um, one of those Evan Designs uh, nano LEDs that are lighting up. You can get them so they're focusing, whatever. And they even added a little puddle of glue here to give a lighting effect off the water. These street lights here, they're in there. They have shine shields on the back so that I'm not throwing light directly on the background. Remember I said about using passenger car lighting strips? This is a pedestrian tunnel under my Princeton Junction station, and it goes from one platform to the other. Uh, the easy, I built, of course, built the tunnel first. So how am I gonna get lights in there? Well, I use just the passenger car lighting strips. If you're O scale, you can get them. They're made by uh, Sunset for their Golden Gate Depot lines. I'm sure you have lighting strips in the other scale as well. Just connect them up, adjust the dimness properly, and you've got the nice well-lit tunnel with the good styrations on the floor and all kinds of lighting. I don't know if this poor woman's ever gonna be able to get up these stairs with this baggage here. But yes, in case anybody asks, these are the two stairs. These are the stairs going to the near side platform. These are the stairs right here. You can see them going to the far side platform and they actually connect above and you can shine a flashlight down the stairs and illuminate the tunnel. I've had people do that. Okay, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the Miller animated signs. They're pretty cool. Um, the, this is the one for Heinz Ketchmer sign, which is actually based on a real sign in Pittsburgh. They're animated, they work really well. The problem is they're just way too glossy and they're really too bright. In fact, you can light up the entire basement with these signs. However, that's easy to solve. You can apply dull coat over the sign. It takes the uh, glossy stuff off. I don't know what we're gonna do without dull coat. And then you add light mist of gray primer or white primer, whatever you think is appropriate until you basically dim the sign down a little bit. It works well. The good news is if the room is pitch dark, they're still plenty bright. So don't worry about that. 
Now, in addition to the signs, Miller provides something called electroluminescent panels. These are called EL panels, and they create very unique illumination effects. Without going through all the physics, the background, is, the other side of this that you see here is one polarity, they're, they're po positive. The foreground is the other plant, which is negative, and electrons go from the positive to the negative, in other words, toward you, toward you. And this coating here is phosphor that glows when electrons hit it. They're powered with an inverter that takes four and a half volts DC. So you can run it with batteries or you can run it with a standard wall wart you get at the Kmart or Walmart or wherever. And the inverter puts out something like 120 volts running at a thousand Hertz. I don't know the exact value because I don't know what values the Miller EL signs work on, but that's standard for an EL sign. In the case of the Miller signs, there are six outputs. You can see rather five are disconnected. I've connected one. So what you do is you cut the panel to shape, any arbitrary shape you want, but you make sure that any shape you've cut has one pair of pins sticking out to it. The pins are allow you to hook up the outputs. The panel color, when it's off, is this pink color here. When it's on, they're kind of a you know, space age blue, which you associate with science fiction movies of the 60s. Neither are really very realistic, but the good news is you can change the color quite easily. If you're content with light, you can simply light spray uh, put a light spray of white paint over the whole thing to change its color. Or you could take glossy photo paper, print whatever thing you want on it, whatever colors you want, sand it thin, and then glue it to the panel using canopy glue or maybe even uh, probably be able to use uh, adhesive transfer tape, but I use canopy glue. One of the things I did with this is I made this bridge. Those of you who've gone on the Northeast Corridor know that just outside of Trenton, going over the Delaware River, there's a sign that says Trenton makes and the world takes. Uh, it looked like this in 1956. Now it's been jazzed up a little bit with, you know, neon lights outlining or whatever. It's not really a railroad bridge, it's a highway bridge. It carries Business 11, but, you know, I took a little liberty here and made it a railroad bridge. I cut out each individual letter out of that um, the EL panels, and then there's a bar underneath you can't see. Everything is plugged into a bar and then powered by that inverter. It's fairly easy to do. The only thing you have to worry about is you need to cut, again, using one of those number 11 scalpels, you cut from the transparent side down. If you cut the other way, you'll cause the transparent side to separate and you'll end up with black spots on the system. I'll give you the classic, ask me how I know that, but anyway. Another thing you do, this is a clock tower. These are three cheap Walmart alarm clocks, battery powered clocks. I think they were $2 a piece, literally. And I made bezels out of nut cans, nuts like blue, blue almond nut cans. You know, I like the ones with the wasabi dressing on them, but never mind. You cut that in a circle, print out the clock face, as I talked about on a computer, and then glue that onto the side. This, these are real clocks, they tell the real time. Not only they look cool, they uh, let me know exactly when my visitors should be leaving the layout if I'm tired of them. Ah, here's another story. I'm sure you know what shadow boxes are. They're small box around a window in which there's a figure or something you want to put inside there to call your attention to it. Well, I got carried away with this a little bit running amok. I always wondered, or I kind of wondered, what it would be for passengers in a train to be looking into the back of tenement buildings while the people in the tenant buildings are looking into the passengers of the train. You know, a little philosophical here. So I populated each of these windows with characters, and not just any old characters. If you look at this one right here, that's the newlywed couple. And if you look at this one right here, that's Miss Torso. If you look at this one right here, that's Miss Lonely Hearts. This pair of windows 
has Sir Alfred and the frustrated music composer, played by the same guy who played David Seville. This pair of windows, it's got the dog lady who lowered her dog in and out with a basket and her husband, Frank. And in this pair of windows, there's the evil Lars Thornwald and his hapless wife who never had a first name in the movie. Well, as you mostly probably guessed right now, these are all characters from Alfred Hitchcock's movie, Rear Window, starring Jimmy Stewart and Grace Kelly. And what I did was I just got the DVD and marched through it frame by frame till I got the appropriate pictures, put them in, inside the window. There is one LED above each window that illuminates the characters. Nothing to do with model railroading, but a lot of fun. Speaking of which, I had to have this. I saw this on Amazon. It's a 3D printed light up moon. And I look, I don't know why Amazon decided I wanted it. You know, they sent me one of these things. You may be interested in this. And I read the reviews of it. The reviews said, this thing is awful. It's only three inches in diameter. I thought it was a foot diameter. Well, gee, for some of us, that's an ideal size. They're still available on Amazon. You can get them in a zillion different colors, different curls, whatever, things like that. But all you do is you take that loom. By the way, it's charged up with a USB uh, or just a plug-in adapter. It'll hold a charge for, oh, 15 hours, something like that. And I hung it up over my layout so I could create the scene of a congressional by moonlight. Uh, there's a very, very fine wire holding it up right here. And I couldn't quite adjust the photo so I could get the texture of the moon and get the right texture of the congressional, but you know what, it makes the point. Now a little bit of advice. Don't overdo your lights. Lights are like anything. They're like automobiles, they're like people on your layout, they're like little scenes. You can have too many of them, like Coca-Cola signs. You can overwhelm the visitor. So use the lights sparingly and use them to highlight specific objects or scenes. Obviously that use the light sparingly, you know, you relax a little bit when you're dealing with a city, when you got a lot of lights in it, but something like this, you know, use them sparingly. As an example of this, this is this woman at a phone booth. You see there's lights coming from the Princeton station and the phone booth itself is lit up. I even went so far as to um, make decals for the letters that say telephone. So that's lit up. And it, this is another example of how you want to be able to adjust the light lighting on the fly. It took a while to get the balance between the building lights and the telephone booth lights exactly where I wanted it, the lights on the railing, etc. We can all, anybody can guess what this poor woman is doing, or maybe she's happy. I don't know. Uh, that's the beauty of this left to the viewer's imagination. Another thing I like to do, I'm kind of fascinated with lights behind trees. I don't know why. Um, maybe I was left in the woods in the dark in the middle of one night. A lone light in the woods can really attract attention. A lot of my viewers come and go to this. There's a lone light in the woods. So people start to look at it closer. You may recognize this as an old Ravel barn, you know, left over from my layout a long, long time ago. And the light just makes you kind of wonder what's going on there. Again, lights behind trees are intriguing. These are the townhouses I showed you earlier. This is a, oops, going the wrong way. How do I go? Okay. There's a stairs. There is an O scale lamppost, there's an HO scale lamppost, and then up in the middle is an N scale lamppost. And your eye just kind of follows the lights. They get more and more obscured by the trees and you wonder where you're going. Here I combine everything, lights behind trees and to enforce the perspective. You'll recognize this as the model of NASA Hall I built from a photograph. That, as I said, is about 1 100th scale. The building behind it, representing the lower pine building in Princeton, is HO scale. Uh, the couple is from Plasticville, who knows what scale it really is. But again, it tends to draw the visitor's attention as they try to look between the tree branches and figure out what's going on and pay attention to things. 
So that really concludes my talk. I, had, I took mercy on you guys and timed it for less than an hour. Uh, the summary is right here. I don't need to read it. I'm assuming you paid attention to everything. The one thing I would, the two things I would leave you with is use the lighting to emphasize what you want your viewers to see and make sure you see the light, not the bulb. So that concludes my talk and I'll be happy to take any discussion or questions. John, I want to thank you very much for your presentation. I thought it was a great use of the lights and you've done a fabulous job with the real tour de force and about how to light a layout. Thank you, Andrew. This is Bernie Rod. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I think Woodlands makes some kind of a paint that you can paint the inside walls of your, your models to prevent the light from leaking through. Do you know anything about that? I have not tried theirs. I've tried other paint and it doesn't do as good a job as the aluminum foil. And it also, you, yeah, it sometimes takes some real skill to get it exactly where you want to do. Uh, Woodlands also makes just a, it sells black paper. I mean, look, whatever works, works. I just found the aluminum foil to be a whole lot easier. Thank you. Uh, John, this is Alan Kirkpatrick. Um, I was wondering, does anybody have a schematic uh, to uh, make, you know, for dimming the individual lights rather than having to buy the Woodland Scenic Light uh, Hub? Does anybody have a schematic of, of that? It, this, I tell you, for, for most of them, you can just use that resistor and an LED and swap the resistors out. You uh -huh. know, there's, um, I don't remember the formula, how the intensity varies with current through an LED, but like that, the Chevy I showed you with the lights in them, that's done by resistor. And it was fairly easy to do because I had the wiring circuit, you know, in front of me and it was not on the layout. So I just swapped out uh, resistors. If you want to make a regulator so that it takes whatever voltage you want and puts out a constant voltage, you can buy regular in integrated circuits and you can put them all in and you can make them. But I got to tell you, those Woodland Scenics uh, um, light dimmers, they're 16 bucks, me, 16 bucks free shipping on Amazon. So that's $4 a circuit. And you have to think about how much time you're going to spend and whatever to make one um, on your own. But anyway, it's just a resistor and an LED to answer your question. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, John, uh, thanks for an excellent presentation. This is Marty McGurk. I, I got a quick question for you. Did I misunderstand? Are you using that Woodland Scenics light hubs to control both grain of wheat bulbs and LEDs? No, no. I'm sorry if I gave you that impression. Okay, I, the, well, uh, I, you probably didn't. I'm just so so. You're running two light buses essentially for the two different. If light, if, light. if I have, like in that hardware store, that Airs hardware store, yes, that was two different light. Well, it's only one light source, I mean, voltage source coming in, right? It's 8.6 volts, that's my main bus. And then I split it in the building itself to power the grain of wheat bulbs and to power the, um, uh, with the LEDs. And incidentally, in that building, I just varied the resistor on the LEDs. I didn't use a light hub. All right, great, thank you, I appreciate it. Now, now, I'm glad you brought something up though, Marty. Um, in my city, to make the lights dimmer in the background buildings, in some cases, I use higher voltage bulbs in the 14.4 volts. In a lot of other cases, I just built dropping resistors. You know, that's fairly straightforward. John, another little thing along, instead of using railroad, uh, you know, rail to uh, act as a bus, uh, I have found the use of the, uh, the, the copper foil that's used for uh, stained glass you can get that in variable widths. That uh, then will follow the contours of walls and make it easier to connect to it uh, as well. Yeah, that, that's a good idea. I should look into that. Is it self-adhesive? Yes, it is. Okay. And you, you can go to Weiser's, which is in our area, Weiser's Glass. Uh, mm -hmm. And they have uh, all different sizes of it. Okay, it's probably cheaper. But instead <laughs> I get my my... N scale, HO scale track at train shows, you know, 
where right. somebody thinks that his old HO track is worth something <laughs> or old any track is worth something. <laughs> John, there's a question in the chat uh, asking, is there a good source you would recommend to understand how to connect the what lights, wires, and control panels? For example, how to connect green of wheat lamps and LED strips if used inside one building. Um, like I said, you have the 8.6 volts or, you know, your wiring bus comes in, let it terminate at a particular spot. In my case, I use the end scale track. So one wire goes to one side of the end scale track, the other to the other side of the track. And then you just wire off of that. The grain of wheat bulbs or the um, bayonet bulbs, you just take the wires from them and connect them directly to one side of the track and the other. The LEDs, you connect them to the rails again of the track, but one leg of it has to go through a resistor or a, um, a resistor, resistor diode combination or to the um, light hub or to that uh, GWNA light regulator I talked to you about. I hope that answers the question. If not, let them re-ask it and all. No, I think okay. that's very helpful. Thank you. John, how did you come up with the 8.6 volt bus? By accident. I, I, I built my city and uh, some of the buildings in the city and I was adjusting the lights and I say, hey, that looks really good. And then it occurred to me, well, if I'm gonna go start lighting up everything else on the layout, I better know what that voltage is. So I measured it and it was 8.6 volts AC. It was, now all jokes aside, if you're going to run incandescent lights, the key to their longevity, right, is to run them well below their operating voltage. So that, that also was a factor. John, this is Doug Gurin. Hey, Doug. Um, two questions. Have you experimented at all with timers that vary the sets of night lights depending on whether it's early evening or late evening or even overnight, like an office building might be all dark after the cleaning ladies leave. And there may be other settings around the, the layout that call for different kinds of lighting depending on the nighttime. The other thing was something I noticed on John Armstrong's layout. He had created what looked like almost a sealed beam for his locomotive headlights. They weren't just colored, you know, lenses but between tracks with cars on either side, you could actually see the beam of the headlight that was very effective. Have you experimented at all with either of those things? Um, the first one is no, you know, I haven't bothered with that. Uh, quite honestly, that's, that isn't of interest to me, to be blunt, you know. It's just, okay. I go down there, I run at night, whatever, and I'm done with it. The um, reflectors on the headlights if I get deeply into a locomotive and kit bash it, you know, like I take a Lionel locomotive and I modify it heavily for two rail and as accurate as possible, I'll generally go in and mess around with the reflector behind the headlight to get the right shape, particularly because Lionel locomotives tend to have a real um, hot, like 6,500 degree Kelvin bulb, you know, glowing in the blue, which isn't realistic. And if I build a local, or actually I had a Coase locomotive which needed some major rebuilding. That's another story where I messed with the headlight there, but I don't actively go in and do it. You know, if it doesn't need anything, then I don't worry about it. Um, a lot of O scale locomotives, Doug, they, they tend to do a pretty good job of making that kind of focused uh, headlight look anyway. Thanks. Thanks. 